dear students, today we will go in a slightly different direction and as we are nearing the end of this series, we will look at the topic of structures and we will focus on the works of uh, probably the most important structural engineer to come out of India, one of the most iconic and that is Mr. Mahindra Raj. Now, structural engineers, their work is seen but they themselves are not seen as much. Whenever we talk of architectural projects, iconic buildings, it is generally the architect who is mentioned and the structural engineer is somewhere sometimes relegated to the background. It is an ironic aspect of modern architecture not that it is not possible without the input of structural engineers to make these amazing buildings we see today, but they are largely unknown. Whenever we talk of amazing buildings today, we remember the names, the, the names that come in front of us are Frank Gehry or Zahadi, the Norman Foster or in India we talk of uh, Charles Correa or the young upcoming architects and firms. But where are the names of structural engineers who gave those dreams wings, made them into a reality? A Burj Khalifa or a Taipei 101 or any of the high rise skyscrapers that we were discussing in the last session could not have been possible without the ingenuity of these structural engineers. Many of the amazing iconic buildings like the Heder Aliyev Center by Zah Hadid or even the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao by Frank Gehry or the Guggenheim Museum in New York by Frank Lloyd Wright could not have been possible without amazing structural engineering in the background. It is very rare to find a combination of a person who is both an amazing architect and a structural engineer. For example, Frank Lloyd Wright himself or somebody like Antony Gaudi to a certain extent Fry Otto. So, there are people like that, but generally since the time of the Industrial Revolution when these professions got divided up, the structural engineer is one of the team members in the design of the uh, building. So, why one of the reasons why they are not uh, so well known is probably because they work in teams and there is a less culture of egos in the structural engineering or the civil engineering profession and some of the famous ones. Uh, have really become well known along with the architects and in India that structural engineer happened to be Mahindra Raj who is both a structural engineer and uh, an amazing structural designer. He had a long stint as a structural engineer right from the post independence period in India of uh, beginning with the modernization of India including that in architecture all the way into the 21st century and he has an astonishing contribution that he has made to modern Indian architecture. Some of the most iconic buildings that come to your mind, many cases the structural engineer behind them would have been Mahindra Raj. So, this long stint of a long life from 1924 to 2022 and a very interesting journey. He began as a structural engineer as a part of the uh, upcoming city of Chandigarh and he worked uh, with the team of Corbusier and his architects and he made genuine contributions in that there are anecdotes that he can read about and his education for example here the masters that he did in the University of Minnesota was actually an outcome of his desire to learn more deeply about structures post his experience in Chandigarh. So, here is a man who followed his passion to be a structural engineer. He was also a person who truly understood what the architect's vision was and how to bring that vision to reality. Notable works that we find in his oeuvre is Hall of Nations, Pragati Maidan uh, at Pragati Maidan in New Delhi, Salarji Museum in Hyderabad, IM Bangalore, Tagore Memorial Hall in Ahmedabad. And he worked with a wide array of architects starting from Corbusier to Convinde, Stein, Doshi, Korea, Ranjit Sabhiki, Jasbir Sane, Ajay Chaudhary, Raj Rival, Kuldeep Singh, many of them he partnered with. And a whole range of works like I said 
think of an iconic building and in many cases the structure engineer behind is Mahindra Raj Sardar Balla Bhai Patel Stadium 1965, Sri Ram Center that we have studied by Shivnath Prasad in 1968. Then there is Kuldeep Singh's flower market in Chennai in 1989, Akbar Hotel in New Delhi 69, Scope Complex by Raj Reval 87, Solar Pavilion in Madhya Pradesh in 2011 or the Premambai Hall in Ahmedabad by B. Vidoshi in 74, National Science Center by A.P. Convin in 94, Vidhan Bhavan in Bhopal in 94 by Charles Correa, Salvakao Church by Charles Correa in Mumbai in 77, I am Bangalore by B. Vidoshi in 1983 and the British Council Library in New Delhi, Charles Correa in 1991. So both in the expanse, geographically working in different parts of India as well as the time span from early 60s all the way into the 21st century. So let us look at some of the examples to, to understand the innovativeness of Mendaraj. Before we begin looking at these works, I would like to make one thing about him clear. Mendaraj worked under tremendous constraints as a structural engineer. The kind of forms that he evolved, the kind of innovations he brought about in his buildings were within the constraints of a somewhat primitive building industry, not having the kind of mechanization that was available in the West, not having the same degree of same finish and quality of building materials, not having the same kind of uh, labor force which was highly skilled and uh, restraints of not being able to use, for example, steel in his buildings as much as he would have wanted, which was so readily available at the time in the West. So when you look at these works that I will show you, keep these points in mind that here is an engineer working with severe constraints in the Indian environment, particularly in the 60s, 70s, 80s era. So when we come to the Gandhi Memorial Hall in New Delhi, which was designed by A.P. Convinda in 1964, it is a concrete structure. When you, this is the overall structural frame that was created and it is made up of these slender vertical columns. So if you look at these columns here, these slender vertical columns, in this model also you see them here. And then this is supported, the, 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 the support they, they support the auditorium with the help of these inclined transverse beams that you see here and you can see them in the overall skeleton of the building and then there are these longitudinal ribs that you find at the top here which help in creating the roof of the memorial hall. So this ingenious simple structure in concrete infilled by walling material led to this memorial hall in 1964. And then the brutalist work of Tagore Memorial Theatre in Ahmedabad in 1965 by Vivi Doshi made up of RCC folded plates which was even in the west something of a unique structural innovation even at that time. And so this RCC folded plates provide the outer shell of this hall of this theatre and there are these, these folded plates are trapezoidal folded frames as you can see this is the uh, trapezoidal image that you get out of it, the somewhat trapezoidal shapes that you get out of it and these are sculptural columns and cantilevers within the building that you find the, the main auditorium, the main hall is cantilevered out as you enter in into the lobby area. This is a vast uh, uh, high space in brutalist raw concrete and you have these amazing columns, sculptural columns over which the hall has been cantilevered out and this dominates the lobby. There is also the freestanding staircase which was uh, a, a well known uh, feature at the time we have seen it in IIT Delhi and there are other buildings where we have the freestanding staircase uh, coming from the developments of Chandigarh by Kurbuzier. Then again we have folded plates not in RCC but in steel. 
So, this was in the DCM pavilion in New Delhi which was designed by Jisbir Sone in 1972. It is a temporary exhibition pavilion having folded plates in steel to create a shortened cone. That means the cone has been sectioned off from the top and the base dia of this cone of folded plates is 43 meter and a height of 28 meter. Now, the drawing that you see, I am sorry it is not very clear because it is directly from the book of Mahindra Raj. This is a very typical drawing that you would make in architectural graphics of a section cone, where this is the sectioned area of the cone and the cone has been sectioned here. This would have been the cone, but that part has been removed and this is the section line here and you can see the sectioned area and this is something that you would draw in your graphics class. So, fundamental geometry that is the you learn in first year in graphics has been the is the background of the DCM pavilion. Now, there is a connection between these three projects, the folded plates in RCC of Tagore Memorial Hall followed by the folded plates in steel of the DCM pavilion and the DCM pavilion being a sectioned cone and then or rather a frustum and then we come to the Hall of Nations at Prakriti Medan by Raj Rival in 1972, which is supposed to be probably the most iconic structural solution of Mahindra Raj and that really established him within in, and gave him an international identity. This work became world famous and we will see the reasons why. This work was an offshoot of the idea of gigantic exhibition spaces and a gigantic exhibition space was needed at the Pragati Maidan. There was a design competition for that and this was the winning entry and this was carrying forward the idea of very huge exhibition spaces that had started rising post the industrial revolution in the 19th century with a great exhibitions like that which was held in the crystal palace and then there was the exhibition around uh, in Paris uh, where we have uh, the picture of the hall of machines. This is the crystal palace, very gerangutan and gigantic exhibition spaces and uh, this is uh, carrying forward of the same idea the large exhibits can be displayed. Now, this happened to be the world's first and largest space frame in RCC. Space frames are already being built in the west, geodesic dome, many other examples are there and these were being built in the west, but they were being built in steel or in aluminum sections. So, the space frame structure is a rigid lightweight truss like structure that you see here in which the struts that you see for example, these are the struts, uh, they, uh, they, they are interlocked with each other in a geometric fashion and in the case of Pragati Madan, the this kind of tetrahedral geometry has been developed out of this. But the only difference in this picture that you see and that of Prakriti Medan is that first of all the, the, the pyramids uh, that you see here, the individual modules, it was inverted and secondly that uh, it was square based pyramid whereas this happens to be a triangular based pyramid. So, here we have the various types of space frames that are are uh, visible around us today. There is the geodesic dome and there is a vault in space frame, there is a flat roof in space frame. This is an example that you can find in uh, 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 a, a center that was designed I believe by Norman Foster in England uh, and then you have the Heather Alia center with a curvy linear uh, form that was possible because of the space frame. Now, the entire complex that was designed as a winning entry included the hall of nations and there were smaller units called the hall of industries. So, this is the hall of nations and there are smaller units the hall of industries and these had the geometry of a pyramid, but a pyramid that has been truncated that the top part has been cut off. So, these are truncated pyramids used as a 
basic module in the Hall of Nations. This is the plan layout, this is the plan of the Hall of Nations and then these are the Hall of Industries. Now, you can see that they are all column free spaces, they are gigantic column free spaces so that they will complete freedom in exhibiting the, uh, uh, the products of various varieties within the space. And this is a picture that shows you how amazingly this space can be used. There are a series of exhi exhibition spaces that are, that are housed here within the Hall of Nations and uh, uh, the, the, even the height becomes useful. So, the space frame was an RCC because of the severe constraint or imp of, of importing large quantities of quality steel to manufacture it in India along with the limitation of steel fabrication at that time in India. Therefore, the architect Raj Rival and Mahindraj decided to make this in RCC and thus came up an iconic structure which was the first and the largest RCC space frame in the world when it was built and became and got international fame to both the architect and the structural engineer. Now, in this case, the space frame of the Prakriti Maidan, Rajrival pointed out that this happened to be both the structure and the sunbreaker or the brisole. In the case of Corbusier's building like the assembly building in, in Chandigarh, the structure was separate and the brisole was mounted on the building. So, the brisole was not a part of the structural system. Whereas, in the Prakriti Maidan, in the Hall of Nations, the structural system of the that is a truncated pyramid itself served as the sunbreaker of the brisole. The second was the idea borrowed from traditional architecture. When we look at the Hall of Nations, we do not remember critical regionalism. We do not seem to have, this is a very modern looking building even, even, even by global standards. But Look at it carefully and hear what Rajarival says that it has the Jali concept in it. So, if you look at it carefully, it has the Jali concept, but obviously on a very huge scale and the hexagons and triangles of a Mughal Jali have been borrowed and incorporated. So, you see there is the hexagon and then there are the triangles within it and that is creating a massive Jali. So, the brisole is a part of the structural system, the brisole is a derivation of the jali and this leads to this amazing volume. Coming to the structure which was the part, the role played by Mahindra Raj, it has in situ piles that are tied together with great beams which are running in two directions that is uh, both in the x direction and the uh, the, uh, 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 in, in two perpendicular directions and thus to create the base of the uh, Hall of Nations. Now, what is a great beam? Great beam is that which transfers the load of the structure above, rather for example, the wall above to the piles below. So, if this is the wall, it transfers its load to the great beam and the great beam then transfers the load to the piles. Because the piles were cast on site, then the great beams were installed above it or cast above it uh, and this was a homogeneous casting, a composite, they were tied together with the great beam and then over it the superstructure came up. Now, the truncated pyramid itself is composed of smaller full pyramids like these are pyramids and starts with an inverted square based pyramid. Now, these pyramids are 4.9 by 4.9 meters. So, if I were to take an example of a square based pyramid to draw it for you, this would be a square based pyramid and therefore, this is 4.9 meters and this is 4.9 meters and the height of the pyramid, this height is 3.5 meters. Therefore, this leads when we keep on multiplying it, this leads to a form of an overall pyramid of 73 meters by 73 meters, which is truncated at 30 meters height 
and the roof span is 39 meters by 39 meters. So, what we have is that we have the pyramid, if I can just show it to you again, that we have the pyramid which is truncated and here we have the 73 meters by 73 meters, within it there are the smaller pyramids of 4.9 by 4.9 meters and 3.5 meters high. This 3.5 meters leads to a total height of 30 meters at which the pyramid has been truncated and at the top level this is 39 meters by 39 meters. So, the basic pyramid, the other thing is that all the lengths that means of the triangular faces of the pyramid, these members and the base member are all of equal lengths that is 4.9 meters and this because it is an equilateral triangular uh, a square based pyramid, it leads to generating a slope of 59, 54 degrees 44 minutes and 8 seconds and this being the slope of this square pyramid as we keep on mounting, it automatically generates the slope that we see in the hall of nations. Now, the same thing on a smaller scale is there in the hall of industries and because it is again a square based equilateral triangular pyramid in the hall of industries that also has the same slope. So, the slope is consistent for the hall of nations and the hall of industries and it is an automatic offshoot of using this kind of a square based pyramid. Now, the elevation module in itself is emerging from these three nodes at the ground and then so, so the, the, if you see it in the overall built form, these are the three nodes with openings on both sides. Now, this is consistent, you again find three nodes here and the three nodes here and with openings on both sides and so, so it is consistent throughout. Now, these three inverted pyramids spring from these three nodes and thus begins the rise of the truncated pyramid, thus they multiply to create an elevational module. Now, there are two such elevational modules on each phase, that means in this phase there are two such elevational modules that are put together. So, this is a very interesting modular system starting from a small square based equilateral triangular pyramid springing from these three nodes rising up to a height of 30 meters and with an angle of 54 degrees something as it rises up the, the two elevational modules are formed that combine together to form one phase and thus there are these four phases on all the sides which are identical to each other. Amazing structural system created by Mahindra Raj worth the iconic status that has that was given to it and then we have the MDC, MDMC city center which he collaborated with Kuldeep Singh in designing in New Delhi and this was also a very iconic form which is something uh, what was related to structuralism because what it has is it has got independent the, the structural elements become the ornament of the building. For example, the freestanding staircase here and the entire building is brutalist in uh, raw concrete finish. There are these continuous slender walls that curve upwards uh, from the ground and they are supported on a central core with four parallel shear walls. Now, where are the shear walls? We see the two shear walls on the outside, one on this side and one on the other and then here you see the construction. This is one shear wall, two, three and four. So, one, two, three and four shear walls which are curving up from 64 meters width at the ground level to 28 meters width at the ninth floor. So, that is how this amazing building was put together. Now, I have shown you this project earlier also. There were smaller units of this also created uh, next to it. Just as the hall of nations has the hall of industries, this NDMC building has a smaller unit adjoining it close to it which is also following the same rhythm 
and uh, structural format. Then there is the STC, the State Trading Corporation building in New Delhi by Raj Rebal in 1988, having 2 lakh 20,000 or 220,000 square meters of office space, hotel, cinema, museum, art gallery, OAT, shops, and the shopping center happens to be the focus of the cultural, social, and commercial life. Now, what it has is something called Wiring Deal Trust. What is a Wiring Deal Trust? Wiring Deal Trust is different from the Triangular Trust in that in the Triangular Trust, you might have seen there are these triangular elements in the Wiring Deal Trust. These elements, instead of being triangular in the trust, they are rectangular. So, that leads to a Wiring Deal Trust or even a Wiring Deal Girder. And these trusses are made up of rectangular rather than triangular frames. The entire structural system of the STC building is based on this architectural form or rather this, this structural uh, system. Now, the external wall of alternate floors is in this variant delta. So, if you look at the building facade, every alternate floor you are seeing these varandal trusses one on this side and one on the other side thus enclosing these alternate floors and intermediary floors do not have the varandal truss. They are automatically generated with in between these alternating trusses and thus we have these alternate trusses you can see in the close up and the truss itself has been cut out with these octagonal cutouts, these windows which are octagonally cut out more or less a kind of a squarish or a rectangular shape indicative of the Varendale Truss. Now, the building is having three heights in it. There is a 23 and an 18 and a 12 meter high tower. So, we have the 12 meter high, the 18 meter high and the tallest is the 23 meter high tower. And this is supported on cast in C2 piles. The Varendale Trusses are cantilevering outward 6 meters from the end. These are the, sh the shafts of the building. The, 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 where the shafts have been provided. As you can see, these are the vertical shafts of the building, service shafts of the building, which are located 23 meters apart from each other. So, this is 23 meters and then again, this is 23 meters. And then you have the Varendale Trust on this side and on this side, this is approximately 14.4 meters and what you get is this Exp expansive column free floor space for the offices permits these column free spaces for flexible internal planning. So, there here we have it again as you can see these are the Varendil trusses or you can see here in the perspective one point perspective section that these are the Varendil trusses on both sides with 14.4 meters apart from each other 14.4 meters apart and they are on every alternate floor. Now, I will draw up a comparison between two buildings, the Commerce Bank in 1997 by uh, Norman Foster and then earlier than this was the STC building that was in 1988. And in the Commerce Bank, the Varendale Trust was used in that these are large Varendale Trusses which are holding the Commerce Bank like a, uh, it is in a triangular form and uh, th this is column free space, this column free office space, column free office space and just like in the STC building, the service cores are on the periphery in the Commerce Bank and uh, it also has sky gardens as you remember I told you in the presentation for search for a new architecture and talking about GYS vision of morphogenesis, sky gardens are provided in the uh, Commerce Bank. So, the idea between of these two buildings is very, very similar using the Varendale Truss. Now, there are other buildings that have come up with Varendale Trusses globally. These are a uh, few examples that you see where Varendale Trusses have been used. Now, the other aspect of it is cantilevering of the, uh, or uh, I am sorry, not cantilevering, but projecting the floors above so that uh, shading happens to the floors below. And uh, in fact, there is also an aspect of mutual shading happening because of this kind of arrangement. So, you also find some mutual shading happening 
in the facade and the overall the cladding that Rajrival did here is with sandstone which is uh, reflective of the traditional architecture of North India. In fact, we find this uniformity in the works of Rajrival in various works that you see and all these works are in Delhi NCR and all of them have this uh, sandstone finish and generally they are of two, two, two colors. There is a darker uh, one and a lighter one in which is used uh, in all these uh, various buildings. Then there is the Olio Francais project that was done in New Delhi by uh, Stéphane Pommier and Anupam Bansal, the form of SPA design in 2004. And this earlier was supposed to have a multiple structural system that the architects had come up with because of the varying spans in the building. But when Mahindraj came on board and he unified the system and made it more efficient and clean and more attractive by providing these precast waffle slabs that you see here. I am sorry the picture is not very clear, but these are the waffle slab panels that have been provided. Each of the panels is 8 meters by 10 meters. Now, not only that, the other things he did was that he altered the beam depths in the larger rooms and then he provided transfer girders that were needed to provide a large column free space in the auditorium. So, what is a transfer girder? Transfer girder or a transfer beam uh, in a sense is that uh, you have the structure above, this load is coming down, but then this load at, the, at this level you require a column free space. So, you have a much uh, deeper beam, it is having uh, more uh, width to span uh, 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 this thing, uh, the, the higher uh, depth to span ratio and as a result of that it carries the load of the structure above and then transfers it to the extreme column. So, for example, if this is the building and this load is being transferred to the grade beam here and here and then it is transferred to these uh, the, the peripheral columns and taken downwards. So, the grade beam is uh, very important to do to create this kind of column free space at a given level and thus you find these grade beams provided to create the auditorium space. Now, another interesting thing they did was that they separated the roof from the building and it is a pergola roof. It is extending outwards, cantilevering outwards and it is becoming a pergola. It is a steel structure and because it is cantilevering out, the roof it in itself is a separate unit. It is standing on four cross shaped as you can see here, four cross shaped concrete columns are supporting this roof and the pergola is a high tech component because it is made up of building integrated uh, photovoltaic panels and uh, BIPV panels that help in generating uh, solar energy or electricity from solar energy rather and uh, it has got fabric louvers as you can see and this together work to regulate the direct sun. Now, there are also ample outdoor spaces that are created which are under this massive pergola where interactions can take place between students and visitors etcetera. These are the drawings, this section shows you the amazing spaces that have been created, the auditorium within as you can see these are the great beams in the section, these are the great beams that you can see which are taking the load of the uh, of from above and thus the auditorium is created and this is the massive pergolad steel roof structure which is uh, somewhat independent of the building. And then we have the Jaisalmer airport by Studio Vanro in 2013. It has a double skin wrap of GRC jallies, glass reinforced concrete jallies and glass itself to provide thermal comfort and also reflective of the traditional architecture of Jaisalmer in a modern context. Now, yellow sandstone has been used which is uh, uh, of, uh, reflective of the material uh, available in Jaisalmer. It connects the identity of, air, of the airport with Jaisalmer. So, the architecture is the identity of Jaisalmer, uh, the, the, the outward appearance in terms of jallies, etcetera 
and the use of material. Now, the jali work at the entrance portico and the mushroom shaped columns uh, and uh, the dropped slab structure have been provided here at the entrance. This is a very large uh, space that has been provided and thus uh, the solar glare does not penetrate into the airport. Now, what is a dropped slab structure that Mahindraj is used? If you look very carefully, here this is a mushroom column. You see, in a flat slab, the beam is not there, the slab is directly uh, being carried by the column. But in that situation, the column can punch into the slab. To avoid that from happening, a drop slab is created. You can see it very neatly here. A drop slab is created underneath the flat slab and then there is the column and that prevents it from punching into the flat slab. And that arrangement has been done. Besides, you see in the roof form, which is a barrel vault, uh, uh, more, not exactly a barrel vault, it is a vault and we will come to the section to explain why I am uh, not referring to it as a barrel vault. There is a gap created here that brings in light from the top for, that is the skylight. These are some of the views of the airport. These are the mushroom columns and these, this is the jali work on the outside. Now, this is the frame of the roof and we will look at that. What is it? There are these 10 asymmetrical trapezoidal steel arches that have been created. This is the, uh, the drawing of the arch and uh, the trapezoidal part is that as, as they go up, they take a kind of a trapezoidal shape and uh, they have a span of 66 meters from one uh, springing point to the other and this formed the airport roof and it is said that it is also uh, reflective of the rise and fall of the sand dunes of, uh, of Rajasthan. Along with that, the arches themselves, these 10 arches, if you can count these 10 arches here, they are interconnected in between by these four triangular cross trusses. And as a result of this, these cross trusses help to contain the horizontal forces that can come through an earthquake, that come through the wind, that come through temperature variations, they account for that. So, this entire structural system was evolved through Mahindra Raj consultants. In conclusion, seeing all these buildings, what do we see? One is the chronological range coming from the early modern period in India in the 1960s all the way till 2013, 2011, 2013. So, this is a very vast uh, period when he saw the rise of modern architecture in India all the way to today. Not only that, we see the different regions in which the structures have been built. I have only looked at only very few for a summary. There are many others spread in different parts of the country. And the architects that he has worked with, some different architects who have associated with him in designing their iconic structures. So all the iconic architects you can name today, at one point, time or another, uh, particularly of that era of the 60s and the 70s, have had a structure uh, that they had done along with Mahinduraj. So, Bibi Doshi says in conclusion, to transform buildings into great architecture, the architect should not only look at the surface, skin and form, but also its structure which needs sensitive engineering and Raj was such an engineer. Raj Rival says that Mahindra Raj has carried the whole modern Indian architecture on his shoulders because of the long, longevity of his work and his interaction with him. That or rather, Rajneval says, my interaction with him was like a jubal bandi that has helped enhance and execute my visions. Such was the amazing contribution of this structural engineer. Now, we are not here to uh, deify or to glorify one man. No, that is not the purpose. The purpose is to tell us the importance of structures in making very amazing and interesting buildings. The Vitruvian triad comes to mind, form, function, structure. All three are important to come up with a good building. But in this case, the structure is done so sensitively and aesthetically that it makes a major contribution to the aesthetic of the building. And that is what a structural engineer 
or a sensitive structural engineer strives to do. That is what Fazlur Khan tried to do when he came up with the idea of different designs, structural designs for skyscrapers. So that is why a CSR looks so beautiful or a John Hancock center which is uh, tapering towards the top looks so beautiful with its cross bracing because Fazlur Khan devoted himself to sensitive structural engineering. I will conclude here and we will, we will begin in the next session with looking at a search for a new architecture. Thank you.